darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with
with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you would lay down your life that i would be set free I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings the chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you would lay down your life that i would be set free oh jesus i sing for all that you've done for me this morning, what things Jesus has done for you today, this last week, this last month, surely there are so many things and he is so worthy of our prayer.
love to hear It's the sound of the Savior's robe As he walks into the room Where people pray Where we hear worship he of his people on their knees. Oh, wake up, you slumbering. It's time to worship him. Awake, my soul, and sing. Sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise you're here with us in the house this morning. Welcome to our family watching online. Um, it is so good to be here. My name is Bronte. I'm an intern here at Sydney and Baps and I get the honour and privilege to hang out with some of our phenomenal young people. Um, I've just got some announcements for you guys. So our welcome lounge is open this week. If you're new to Sydney or new-ish, oh sorry, you can take a seat. You don't have to stand. That's all right. We only stand for worship in the word here, so take a seat. Um, so if you're new or newish to Sydney, our welcome lounge is open this week. So if you are wanting to connect with people or just wanting to say hey or know a little bit more about us, um, you can just head up to the back corner after the service and Kath and her team will welcome you and let you guys know a little bit more about us and what we do here. You'll also get a free coffee, which is always great from our cappuccino machine and um, hopefully a Sydney Baptist keep cup and we'll just let you know more about who we are and what we're here to do. 
Um, next Sunday after the service at 11.45, there'll be a meeting that Pastor Steve is running and it's to chat about our next steps forward as we're developing our ministries and care with people in our church um, for those with mental health challenges. So if you participated in the Sanctuary Mental Health course and also those who couldn't but are interested in this sort of thing or interested in coming along, um, the meeting will take place in the hall um, after the service next Sunday at 11.45. Um, Just a friendly reminder that October the 15th is our closing date for nominations for church council. So if you know someone or you're thinking of someone that would be awesome on council, let our secretary Nikki know. Um, Her email is up on a poster in the foyer or you can just let her know directly. Um, It's a really awesome way to serve. So if you're interested yourself or you know someone, please, please let us know. Um, We're now going to take up the offering. So if our ushers could just get ready and head towards the back. Um, There are also other ways to give, so we've got our bank details on the screen if you're wanting to give electronically or via direct deposit, but if not, our buckets will be passed along. Okay, we're just going to pray as we um, take part in offering. God, we thank you for today and the day you have made. We thank you. um, We pray over our offering, Lord. We thank you for the gifts we are able to give to you to further your kingdom, Lord. We pray over the stewardship of this money, that it will be used by our church with wisdom and discernment in order to further your kingdom for our community, God. We thank you so much for our church and the community and family we are. We thank you for each and every person in the room and each and every person watching online, God. We pray for those members of our community who are sick or unwell and can't be with us today, God. We thank you for them and we pray over them. We pray healing and peace over their families, Lord. We pray over our wider community. We thank you for this amazing area we live in, Lord, that we are able to serve and live and do life with people around us, God. We pray that we'll be stewards and flames of you out in our community, God, that we'll be a vision of you in our neighborhoods, in our streets, in our schools, and in our workplaces, God. We pray for our world. We pray for each and every service happening across our state and across our city, Lord. Every person meeting in a school basketball hall or in an auditorium as a church or in their lounge room, Lord. We pray that you are where we are. When two or more gather, Lord, you are there. We thank you for all the Christians meeting as a united kingdom across the world, Lord, that you'll be with them, God. We thank you so much for your goodness and your grace, Lord. We pray for any unrest or um, unpeace in our world, Lord, that your hand is on that situation, that you are in boardrooms with leaders, Lord, that you are working across our world, God. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy, Lord. We thank you that you're a good God. Amen. So the buckets will be passed along. So if you're feeling compelled to give, we encourage you to. But if not, sit back, let them pass you by. We're going to continue to worship.
totally hopeless God you you never abandon us you never forsake us you are always there God you are always going before us Lord and Lord I thank you right now that, that when we don't feel it 
Lord, you give us community who will be there to support us. And Lord, I just pray for this church, that this can be a church that supports others. Lord, that we can be building each other up, that we can be praying that prayer when someone can't, Lord. Lord, I thank you, God. Amen. Let's continue. We've got one more song to sing together.
God, we just thank you, God, that, that as soon as we let you in, Lord, you are there. Lord, we thank you that as soon as we say yes, you're, you're already there, God. So come and live in us, Lord. Lord, we welcome you. Lord, we love you and we worship you this morning. Amen. Thank you. Thank you to Mel and the worship team. Isn't it neat when, uh, even before the preachers come on, you have that sense that God's already been speaking? And I really do sense that the Spirit has already been at work this morning. Good morning. How are you all? Good. There's something about October, don't you think? Well into spring, winter days, cold days, rainy days. Love it. I'm starting a series today called People Like Us from the Old Testament. And they're like us because they were human, but they lived such as to show us an example of a life lived by faith and also one that trusts God. And today I'm going to start by taking a look at Noah. Noah from the Old Testament. Many people are familiar with the name Noah as the man who built the ark in the Bible story. Noah lived a long time ago. Scholars range that he lived about 4,000 to 5,000 years ago. And we don't know a lot about uh, what Noah did for a living. We don't know whether he was rich or whether he was poor. We do know that the time Noah lived in was an evil time, a time of great wickedness and evil was upon the earth. And because of that, God decides to destroy the human race except for Noah and his family. Let's read it from Genesis chapter 6, uh, verses 5 onwards. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all that time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I've created and with them the animals, the birds, the creatures that move along the ground for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord had Noah build a a huge boat, an ark and to gather a pair of every kind of animal and bird and bring them into his ark. And then it started to rain, and it rained, and it rained for 40 days. The account tells us that it was a great deluge that the Lord sent that resulted in a flood, and it destroyed every living creature on the earth, except for Noah, his family, and all the animals and the birds which were in the ark. And then after six months, the waters finally receded and Noah and his family and all the animals and birds left the ark and went out to repopulate the earth. I just want to say up front that I'm aware that there are different schools of thought on the story of Noah and the flood. And my purpose isn't to go into uh, the debates around the scientific uh, rationale or about the historical narrative my purpose with this message is to focus on what we can glean from the walk of faith that Noah had and what his life's example speaks to us Hebrews 11:7 says this about Noah by faith Noah when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear built the ark to save his family by his faith He condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes from faith. Today I want to take a good look at the faith of Noah. And the first thing I want to highlight this is that Noah is an example of an obedient faith. If you ask a majority of people if they run their lives by faith, they would say, no, I run my life based on fact. And however unknowingly, Most people that might say that are actually living a lot of their lives by faith. Take the advertising industry. 
They spend billions of dollars each year trying to convince us to put faith in their products, that theirs is the best, that theirs will make our hair grow back, that it will remove every wrinkle, and that's by faith. If you've ever flown, how often have you put your faith in the skill of the pilots and of the ability of the flight engineers? When we come to a green light, you are operating by faith that the other people have stopped when the light is red. The point here is that Noah understood faith because when God spoke to him, he believed God. The Lord says, Noah, build me an ark. And you can imagine Noah taking a few seconds, if not minutes, saying, sure, Lord, um, what's an ark? Isn't that a bit bizarre, God? And I'll explain that in just a moment. The second thing I think we can find from Noah's example is that his faith was an absolute trust in God and in God's word. God spells out quite specific instructions of how Noah was to build the ark. For instance, in Genesis 6, let me read a couple of verses, 14 to 16. God says, go make yourself an ark of cypress wood, not any wood, cypress wood. Make rooms in it, coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it leaving below the roof and opening one cubit high all round. God is giving very specific instructions about, um, about the ark and then about what's to happen with the ark. Bring uh, two of all the living creatures, male and female, keep alive with them. And then in the final verse in the chapter, it says, verse 22, Noah did everything that the Lord had commanded him. Noah obeyed God. And it wasn't just an intellectual ascent. He actually built the ark before it started to rain. Can you imagine if Noah was here today and he came to you and he said, God's told me to build an ark in Sydenham. And you would think, you are crazy, man. Like, there's no sea around here. I mean, I'm still trying to find the lakes in Taylor's Lakes. If anyone finds them, please let me know where you can sail a boat there. I'm told that there are some form of lake somewhere. I haven't seen it. If you were asked to build an ark right here in the west here, you would go, that's crazy. That's just dumb. You can't have heard from God, but Noah had. And he trusted God completely. There was a burning building in New York City in the Harlem district, and a blind girl was perched on the fourth floor ledge. And the firefighters had become desperate because they couldn't get the ladders between the buildings and they couldn't get the girl to jump in the net because she couldn't see, she was blind. And finally her father arrived and he shouted through a loudspeaker and he said, Darling, it's your father, I'm here, I want you to jump. Hearing her father's voice, she relaxed a bit and she eventually jumped. Why? because she knew her father's voice and she trusted her father. And Noah was this type of man. And it's for this reason Noah is called a just and a righteous man because he believed God even when it seemed nonsensical. He didn't fully understand. He trusted God. Do you know what the name Noah actually literally means? The name Noah is translated as rest or comfort. And that's exactly what Noah found in his relationship with God. I think one of the big lessons in faith from knowing is that obeying God means to follow him even when it seems illogical, even when it doesn't make sense. Noah didn't have his own agenda. He didn't have his own timetable. He did what God commanded him. It was an unconditional obedience while he didn't have any idea of the big picture. He's just been asked to build an ark in a place that is very far from water. A huge boat, no less. And in fact, not only was it far from water, 
but they hadn't seen water for a long time. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 5 to 7, it says, the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. It's difficult to discern whether there was a lack of rain was temporary or whether it had been permanent, but a lot of credible scholars believe that the rain had not fallen on the earth um, fr from up from creation till that time of the flood. Rather, there were underground springs that were being provided so that the people could have water to drink and to feed the crops. So Noah's being asked to build an ark and the people are asking, what for? It's not going to rain. It hasn't rained yesterday. It didn't rain last month. It hasn't rained for years. Why would you build a boat? That is just so illogical. And then there's the issue of going to round up two of every animal. I mean, what a logistical nightmare. Noah didn't know how any of this was going to work out. But you know what? He didn't complain. And he just said, Lord, I'll do whatever you say. And I think if Noah was standing before you today, he would say to you, have faith in God, even when it doesn't make sense. Just trust what God puts before you. But you know, the temptation for us is to resist. It's human nature. We want to play safe. We don't want to look silly. We don't want to do anything that's too unexpected. But it's those moments when we hear God's voice that it doesn't make sense where he shows up. We've had today evidence in our worship time of Mel hearing a prompting of the Spirit and obeying that and probably deep down wondering, is this even right to say this? Is, you know, what if, what if it means nothing to nobody? I'm sure she didn't think all that through, but it's possible. But you step out with the prompting that God's given you. You have to trust that even though we don't understand what the outcome will be, that we can trust God. Now, I'm not advocating we throw our brains out. God has given us brains for a reason. But there are some things you cannot figure out. Who's ever figured that out? There are some things you just can't figure out. And you've got to trust God's track of faithfulness. If you're a parent and you ask your kids to do something... What, did they, what do they invariably say? Go and make your bed. Go and clean your room. What's the answer? Why? Why? Now, a parent knows why. We could list a whole lot of reasons why they need to go and clean their bedroom. But, you know, they probably wouldn't care for the answer anyway. But often, as a parent, we know why. And when God asks us something and we don't know why, we just need to trust him. Another thing we learn from Noah's example of faith is that faith involves costly obedience. Noah spent about 100 years building that ark. Now, that's no small task for a family of eight and without today's technology. Each day he cut and gathered the wood as he began to build the ark and Noah would warn his neighbours, his siblings, his father and his grandfather about the coming judgement. And Noah endured much ridicule because no matter how much he prayed, no matter how much he tried to persuade him, they did not believe him. I can imagine Noah's neighbours gossiping about him. What an idiot that guy is. I don't know what's happened to our neighbour. He's lost his mind. He's out there building a boat in the desert. And then you can ask others coming along and go, oh, how's it going, Noah? How's the boat going today? Oh, I see there's one plank more today. You better hurry up, Noah. We're going to all drown soon. And then others would ambush Noah's sons as they were gathering food for the ark. There goes dumb, dumber and dumbest going to help build this boat. And each night, Noah would gather with his wife, his sons and their wives probably needing to be encouraged afresh 
because of the hits they were taking every day for their obedience. You know, maybe one of the reasons God gave Noah his family was that in times of discouragement and loneliness and grief, he could have a family that he could pour out his heart to and where they could encourage. You know, obedience generally is not cheap. It costs. And we rarely get to choose how we will pay for the obedience. And Noah paid the price. Next, Noah's faith is also an example that true faith isn't just words. It isn't just notions. True faith results in action. True faith is not just talk. It's not just wishful thinking. It's genuine. It's the real deal. Hebrews says Noah had faith because he obeyed God. In Genesis 6, 22, Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. You know, Noah, if he'd said, sure, God, I'll build the ark, but never got around to starting, or only built it halfway in the time that God had told him, then he would have gotten fairly wet at the end there and, and his family, but he would have demonstrated that he's not really got faith. Real faith will show itself in action. And then Noah is also an example of standing up for God's way of right living. In Genesis 6, verse 9, 10, it says, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. In Hebrews 11, where there is the story of the heroes of faith, we're told of Noah. I'm going to quote Eugene Peterson's take on this from the message, verse 7. His act of faith drew a sharp line between the evil of the unbelieving world and the rightness of the believing world. As a result, Noah became intimate with God. Has anyone seen the 2014 movie Noah that had Russell Crowe in it? Well, I'll tell you, that Noah there is more obsessive than he is righteous. Being righteous didn't mean that Noah was perfect, but it meant that he had a right relationship with God. He walked step by step in faith. Noah did a lot more than building a boat. He actually preached to the world that there was a coming judgment and that people had the opportunity to turn. They had the opportunity to change. There was a great evil in the world, but there was a way through. And you know, they had 100 years to repent, but no amount of time was going to change the minds. The, the earth and the people in it were so evil. And that's why God says, well, that's it, I'm pulling the plug. Note in the phrase in verse 10, Genesis chapter 6, Noah was blameless among the people of his time. Noah was different to the crowd. Noah was a faithful witness to his generation and his lifestyle was in a sharp contrast to the rest of the world. He was a man of deep convictions. You know, the society in that day was morally corrupt. It was morally bankrupt. And Noah was able to stand different to that. And, you know, it wasn't easy for a life lived for God in that day. There was such a cultural pressure, some things haven't changed that much, have they? We live in a cultural pressure, often. Noah wasn't afraid to stand for what he believed in, even if he meant he was going to stand alone, even if he meant he was swimming upstream when everyone else is swimming downstream. It takes a great deal of faith and courage to follow God when everyone else is going in the opposite direction. I read this, uh, Mike Del Carbo was a runner in a cross-country championship that was held in the United States. And during the race, 123 of 128 runners missed an important turn in the race. They all went in the wrong direction. One competitor, Mike Del Carbo, he turned the right way and stayed on the 10,000 metre course. He began to wait at the turn-off for other runners to follow him what he thought was the right way. But he was only able to convince four 
other runners of the 128 runners. When asked later what his competitors thought of his mid-decision race not to follow the crowd, he responded, they were all laughing, thinking that I'm going the wrong way. They didn't want to hear that it was the right way. And you know what I thought about that? That it takes courage to go the right way when you've got the mass of voices, when you've got the group, the crowd speaking the other way, when you get the laughing, the jeers, the mocking. You know, being right, being right, even right with God, is often not popular. And it does require the trust in God. Noah shows us that finding yourself in the minority isn't necessarily such a bad thing. Next, Noah is an example of a persistent faith. It's a fact that, you know, when God looks for faith upon the earth, when he looks for faith from us, when he looks for people of faith, he is actually looking for people that never, never give up. They might find themselves on the ground sometimes, but they actually get back up. And you know, this is a characteristic that of the legends of faith. They were so persistent. You know, Noah had to wait 120 years for the fulfilment of God's promise. He had to wait all those years to see that there was a reason for the ark to even be built. 120 years. Let me ask you, could you have maintained your enthusiasm for 120 years? I find it hard to find it long enough to finish a book, you know, during the week, let alone all those years. 120 years is a long time to keep persisting because, you know, we live in an age where we want immediate results. And Noah waited. Think about Mrs. Noah. When Noah comes home for dinner and she says, how was the work today, hun? Well, same as every other day. I bet there were days when Noah couldn't get out of bed and they hadn't even gone through lockdown in Melbourne. Noah would have felt like saying this, how long, Lord? This is just, you know, it's year 78 of this. How long? But every day, 45,000 days, 45,000 days, Noah gets up goes to work, hammering the nails, chopping the wood, fitting the planks. You know, I think one of the reasons why we may not succeed in life is that we give up too soon. Because if I could have just hung in there, maybe God would have used me. And the difference is often persistence. You know, there are three things that are going to tempt you to give up in your walk of faith. One is problems. Problems are going to tempt you to give up. To give up on what God wants for you. The second is pressures. Pressures will tempt you to give up before you reach the goal that God has in mind. And the third is people. People can cause us to give up. People that are negative, critical, demanding, not understanding, not dependable. People, Noah dealt with every variety, but he kept on going. So can I say, don't let these things stop you from persevering with faith. Don't let the problems, don't let the pressures, and don't let people get in that way. Now, it's okay to take a breather when you need to have a breather. Sometimes it's a season of resting and just sitting back, but don't make that the pattern. Don't let it cause you to give up the walk you began. I want to encourage you, sure, sit for a while, get up then and keep moving forward and serve the Lord and do what he wants you to do. Noah is such an example of someone that stood up in a faithless world and was an example. Now, the next thing I want to point out is really key because it's what kept Noah doing these things. 
keeping on believing, keeping on persisting, persevering. And that is that Noah is an example of walking close with the Lord. It says in Genesis 6, 9, three simple words, four simple words, Noah walked with God. Noah walked with God. So guess what? Noah was not alone. He did not walk alone. The secret to Noah's ability to stand blameless, I think, can be attributed to those words. The reason Noah was able to keep going despite the mockery that was being going, the reason Noah could keep going despite the illogical sense of building a massive boat in a place where there's no water, was that he walked with God. In other words, he cared a great deal about his relationship with God. His primary focus was to be in fellowship with the Lord. His motive for doing these things was not to escape the ridicule of people or the abuse. His motive was that he would be in communion with the Lord. This is the key to it. This is the key to faith. It's actually having that relationship with God where you can say, I am walking with God. Who can stand against? We sing a song like that, don't we? If God is for you, who can stand against you? Am I walking with God? Are you walking with God? Really? With God? Daily? Nightly? You see, it's walking with God that we find the power. The power to fight those pressures. The, fight, the power to overcome the problems. The power to resist the people that you know, might cause us to stray. And it's not our power. It's that when we walk with God, it's his power that we are reminded of, that we discover. It's his power at work, in us, through us. It's his power that enables us to walk finding the way. It's his power that enables us to find the purpose. It's his power that leads us to safety. Think about it. If Noah hadn't been walking with God, we might not have this story to tell. Telling him, build an ark. Be safe from the flood. There's safety in walking with God. Friends, the story of Noah is the story of God's faithfulness to his promises. The story of Noah shows that God protects his people when adversity comes. If Noah was standing here today, I think he would also say to us, God proves himself to be true. God keeps his promises. Noah's story is that God's promises are bigger than our failure and our shortcomings. Isn't that good news? Do you know that in Genesis there's a story about Noah that doesn't get talked about a lot? In Genesis chapter 9, Noah gets shamelessly drunk. So drunk uh, that he'd had an impact on the relationship between him and one of his sons. But guess what? Noah was not perfect. He made mistakes. On that occasion, he blew it. And I believe that God made sure that the dark side of Noah was written down in Scripture so that it can communicate to us that, hey, we're human, and no matter when, even if you've blown it, that doesn't mean you have to be a failure at all because it's not about the failing or the falling. It's about the getting back up. And even when you stuff it up, that does not disqualify you in your relationship with God. Get up, confess your sin, receive God's forgiveness, and don't go back. Because here's the thing, God uses ordinary, flawed, failing people and puts his life into us so that we can be obedient and persistent people. Even in our failures and shortcomings, God does not give up on us. You see, God's promises are bigger than our problems. 
It certainly would have been more convenient for Noah and his family if there'd never been a flood. He would have been spared the ridicule, the opposition, the treatment from the people around him. And then there was the fact that he was going to have to be stuck in the ark for six months with all those animals. I don't think that was such a pleasant experience. I'm sure it got crowded pretty fast on that boat. God's protection of Noah and his family didn't mean that life was easy, but it did mean they would survive the flood. This illustrates a really important point, and that is that nowhere in the Bible does, it, does God promise that we will all have freedom from adversity. Whether we like it or not, Christians are like everybody else, we will all suffer problems Christians sometimes have trouble paying their bills. Christians sometimes get fired from jobs. Christians sometimes get Ds on their report card. Christians sometimes play for teams that don't win a game all season, like a basketball team that I was in when I was in high school. Not sure if I had anything to do with that, by the way, but just just saying. Christians sometimes have terrible conflicts. Christians sometimes have marriages that fail. Christians sometimes get sick. Like all, we have our afflictions. Like Noah, we all have troubles. But here's the thing. God is with us. And God will be with you. And he will protect you in the midst of it. No matter how hard it is, it is going to be okay. You are going to make it. It may not be fun, but when you walk with the Lord, God is with you. And I'll tell you what, it may not be fun in the ark, but it's better than being outside in a flood. Look at the beautiful words of the promise that Genesis chapter 9 gives, verse 14. Whenever I bring the clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all the living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. And then in verse 17, God says to Noah, this, and he's talking about the rainbow, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and and all of life on the earth. Friend, next time you see a rainbow in the sky, just be reminded about what it means that God has made a promise to be always with you. God has made a commitment. And it's interesting that that verse says all people are recipients of that promise. So whatever you have, you're going through, financial struggles, serious health problems, whatever it is, rejoice. Let the rainbow be your reminder. You are loved by God every time that shows. You might be lonely. You might be frustrated with your situation in life. Let the rainbow be a reminder that actually in the Lord... You have a safety you'll never find anywhere else. Look for that rainbow and rejoice in what it means. And when you do next time, see that rainbow. Remember this message and remember Noah. Remember the trust and the obedience and the faith and the persistence that Noah exampled in his life. And remember this, that when we put our faith in God, he always works things out. In the end, that's a promise. Walk with God. You're never alone. Would you join me in prayer? It might be that you've come along uh, this morning, here, gathered, present, or maybe you're online. 
And you need to hear those words afresh before you today. You need to hear the Lord saying to you, walk with me and you'll never be alone. Walk with me for I will give you the power to press through. If the Lord is saying that, to your heart or your spirit today, I pray you'll receive it. Let the Lord meet with you with that promise. Father, I pray for all of us that we would be able to take this example of Noah and be encouraged, be stirred, be challenged. Lord, that we might aspire to be a people that don't just follow the crowd, but who stand up for the rightness of God, who stand up for what you say, even if it's not popular. Lord, I pray you'll give us the ability to have to follow the example of Noah, that we would just keep persisting and keep persevering and not give up on our faith, on our involvement in community, in our service in ministry. Lord, that we would keep our eyes on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Father, I pray that you would lead us and enable us to be a people that grow in faith and grow in trust, that like that girl on the ledge, even when we don't see, even when we can't see, we would be willing just to jump and trust in the arms of of a loving Father. Lord, I pray that you'll lead us in this way. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Let's uh, worship.
choose to pray to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand again. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. For joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I It's a pretty bold promise, isn't it? All my days, yes I will. We've just been singing it. But for the grace of God, we won't be able to do that. So I really want to encourage you to lean in. Because we cannot hope to fulfill any kind of promise like, Lord, I'm going to just give to you, I'm going to serve you, I'm going to honour you. For the rest of my days, we're going to need to be in that walk with the Lord. We're going to need to be drawing on the power of His Spirit so we can actually do that. I want to encourage you next time you see the rainbow in the sky, just remember the promise of God to humanity. His love, His protection, His safekeeping. I want to leave you with a a verse, a blessing from the book of Romans, Romans chapter 15. Now may the God of hope fill you with all the joy and peace in believing, so that the power, by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. God bless you. Have a great week.